with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. seated. Thank you for the music this morning. You will realize as we go through this passage of scripture uh, how pertinent those songs are in relationship to what we are going to read this morning. I've titled this um, History Unfolds. History Unfolds and we're in Luke chapter 1, um, 5 through 25. And uh, last week we looked at the author Luke, and we, we understood that he's a physician. We've also understood that he is a co-worker of Paul, that he went on the second and third missionary journeys and, uh, and was possibly with Paul even at his death. Uh, we learned that Luke is a systematic theologian. He is all concerned about putting things in order and having it in place. Um, we find out he's a pastor. He writes this, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he writes this down for one person, the man named Theophilus. So he has a heart for this one. We also find out that he's an evangelist because he wants Theophilus to know in, without any doubt that Jesus is Lord, even stand up against the enemy to say Jesus is Lord. And then the last thing too, we found out that he's a historian and uh, that's what we're going to see this morning as he unfolds history for us. Last week, we went through the, what they call the prologue. It's four, four verses, but in the Greek, it's all one long sentence in the classic Greek. And now, he's going to shift gears. He's going to turn to common Greek, and you're going to notice the sentences are, are a lot shorter. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the passage first. It reads like a story, so just listen into the story. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years." And when his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. And at the hour of incense, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of righteousness to make ready for the Lord a prepared people." Well, how can I know this, Zechariah asked the angel, for I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, 
And I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen. You will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. And when he did come out, he could not speak to them. Uh, Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. And when the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, the Lord has done this for me and has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. God's blessing upon the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we walk back through this passage again, as we unfold these characters that Luke brings out for us to see. But more importantly, Lord, help us to understand how this passage directly relates to our lives today. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. On your sheet this morning, you just have some names. You have some spaces and you have some names and events. And so as I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk back through this passage again and I'm going to talk about those names that are on your sheet. And the first one is Herod. And uh, Herod is just a title. um, And there there were many Herods, but this is the first of the Herods. And he's called Herod the Great. And the reason he's called Herod the Great is because he did a bunch of great things. He did do a lot of improvements to different cities. And probably the greatest improvement that people saw was that he rebuilt the temple. So he did some great stuff. But there was also a part of Herod that was not so great. And the part that was not so great was he was very jealous. He was very jealous of his position that was given to him by Rome. He was kind of a puppet leader, but it was given to him. And if anybody threatened his position, he had one way of dealing with it. And the way he dealt with it was off with their head. I mean, he, he, he got rid of his wife. He got rid of his mother-in-law. He got rid of his sons, uh, some of his sons. And later on in the story, we know that Jesus was called king of the Jews. And so what did he do? He tried to get rid of all of the boy, baby boys two and under. He, he tried to get rid of them. He was a notorious leader. Uh, one of the worst things uh, was that he was getting close to death. And so what Herod did was uh, he knew he was so notorious that no one would mourn for him when he died. So he gathered up all the officials and all the rulers in Jerusalem and he put them in prison. And he held them there and he told them and gave the order that when I die, as soon as I die, all of them get slain. Therefore, there will be weeping and crying in the streets of Jerusalem and it will look like the people are mourning for me. I just give you that so you realize how bad it was during that time under Herod the Great. Notice here also Luke is a historian. He gives us a name. He gives us a very well-known name, a well-documented name, a name where you can go back in other history and find out about who Herod is. He also gives you the time frame that if it's Herod the Great, it's from 36 B.C. to about 4 B.C. And so you got the time frame to work with. He is systematically going through, giving you the facts as we go through this story. So there's Herod. The next one on your sheet is Zechariah. And he's described in some of the versions as a certain priest, um, just a certain priest. His name means God remembers. You might want to write that one down. His name means God remembers. Now, Josephus, who was also another first century uh, uh, Jewish historian, said that there were about 20,000 priests at the time. About 20,000. There's 24 different divisions. 20, 24 different divisions. And so this is just one of the divisions that Zechariah is a part of. So if you take 24 divided into 20,000, that means each division had 833. So he was one out of 833. So he was just a certain priest that was there. But he was a servant of the temple. And that was a noble position to hold. 
It was a, he, would, he would deal with the scriptures. He would deal with sacrifices. That was his life. And these divisions, uh, uh, twice a year, you would be serving in the temple. Two different weeks. Well, Zechariah is married to this lady named Elizabeth. And her name means, my God is faithful. So you might want to write that down. My God is faithful. So Zechariah, God remembers, married Elizabeth, my God is faithful. And her name, um, she, well, we find out that she's a daughter of a priest. So she's in the priestly line. So he kind of like married right within the church. And she would know what a priest's life is like and everything. So she, she, she understood the lingo and everything and the schedule and all that kind of stuff that would go on. But not only that, Elizabeth is named after the very first priest's wife. Aaron is the very first priest. And if you go to Exodus 6.23, you can read that his wife's name was Elizabeth. So Elizabeth is named after the very first priest's wife. Wow, you're talking about a church family here. You're talking about a church couple here. Well, they are a church couple because it says in the next verse that they're righteous, meaning they have a faith in God, meaning that they, like Abraham, believe God in faith. I mean, they, they, underst they understood who God was. And not only that, they lived a life of faith. They were very devoted to the laws that God had given, and they didn't assume them. They, they followed after them. So here's a very devoted couple, a priest and his wife, who were a part of the temple service. But then comes this big word, but. Remember, every time you see but in the scripture, uh, something, something big's happening here. She's barren. She's not able to conceive. They have no children. And that is a huge shame in that society. They would have looked at that and said, oh, something's wrong here. But even more than just something is wrong, something must spiritually be wrong with Zechariah and Elizabeth. God must have something out for them. Something, something's not right here. And God must be punishing them in some way, shape, or form. Now, we know that's not true. But that's the stigma of the time. And, that's, and, and we're told they're well off in years. That means they're 60 plus years old. So they've lived with this stigma their whole life. Their whole married life together. Well now, Zechariah goes into the temple. He's going to burn incense. He's gonna, it, this happens in the morning and the evening. And you would go into the temple. Only the priests could do this. They go into the holy place. There's a veil. And then there's the holy of holies. There's only one person who can go into the holy of holies. And that's the high priest. And only one time during the year. So if a priest is able to go into the holy place. And the temple. The, where they burnt the incense was on a table. That was right in front of the veil. So this was the closest as a priest. That you could get to the holy of holy place was right there if you were picked to be able to burn incense. And when you put the incense on there, a cloud of smoke would rise up. You would take the time to pray for the people and pray on behalf of the people. That cloud of smoke was symbolic of the prayers rising up to God. Okay, So this is, this is a big deal. This is so big of a deal that if you take the 20,000, divide it by 24, you get 833 uh, in each division. Now, it's a week's service. It's morning and evening. So you'd have 14 times that your name was in the hat. One out of 833. 14 times over that week. If you work that out mathematically, you get about a 1.5% chance of, of your name actually being pulled out of there. But then you add on to that that he's well off in years. So he's 60 plus years old. So he started at around 30. He's been doing this for 30 years. So 60 times... He's been serving in the temple because it's twice a year. 60 times he's been serving. If you take the 60 times, the 14 times per week that you would have the opportunity for your name to be taken out of there. If you times the 60, 30, 60 by 14, you get 840. If you get 840, how many priests are in a division? 833. So this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So when Zechariah's name gets at it well off in years... Gets pulled out of that hat or however they do that. He says, Zechariah, you're up. 
I mean, this is the highlight of his life. This is the closest he's going to get to the holiest holies veil. And to go into that place all by himself. So I hope I painted that picture there. While this happens, the people are outside. It's probably in the evening. It says a lot of people were there. There were more that gather in the evenings. And uh, as he puts the incense onto the coal, the puff of smoke goes up. Then Zechariah's job at that point is to pray for the people of Israel. To pray for the coming Messiah. To pray about the Herod situation. To pray about the Roman invasion. To pray about Israel in general. That's what he's there for. He's to pray on behalf of the people. Bring petitions before them. And he steps back. And when he steps back, wham! There's an angel. Right there. And, and this breaks 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence between the last verse of Malachi and the first verse of Matthew. God has not said anything in 400 years. And he walks in there and boom, there's an angel. And an angel is a messenger of God. An angel is not anybody to be worshipped. Not at all. The angel brings the word of God. And so here an angel is standing before him. And Luke gives us the common response when you meet an angel, you're afraid. Okay, and then the Luke gives us the common response back from the angel. Do not be afraid. He does that and we'll see that over and over again. But he tells Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. And you might think, oh, well, yeah, he's been praying for a child. And they probably were. They probably were. But probably as the years were going by, that probably got less and less and less, you know, kind of thing. But that's not the prayer we're talking about here. He says the prayer that is being answered is the prayer that you're praying for the people of Israel for the coming Messiah. That prayer is being answered. And what the angel does is he goes right into solution mode. He goes right into solution mode. He he goes right into how is this going to happen? How is the coming Messiah going to happen? And he starts right off. He says, Zechariah, God remembers, and you're married to Elizabeth the God who is faithful, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. That, that kind of makes me think that, you know, when he put the incense on the coals, was it a blue smoke? Ah, maybe. Maybe it's the first reveal. First reveal. Woo, blue smoke. Like, okay, that's the ultrasound. I mean, he knows the sex of the baby already. And, um, and he says you're going to name this child John. You know what John means? God is gracious, or God's grace. So God remembers, meets up with the God who is faithful, and God is bringing grace. Isn't that powerful? Just in their names that are there. Now, on your sheet there, there's, um, there's a spot, I think it's on the back side, it says proofs. Proofs. I'm going to give you a few of these as we go along. The first one, if you want to write down, is Abraham and Sarah. Because Zechariah is a priest, and so he would have remembered this story about Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah were an old couple. And God came along to them and said, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a child, a promised child of the covenant. And his name's going to be Isaac. And and and. They are older than Zechariah and, and Elizabeth. And so just, just kind of put that away that Zechariah would have remembered from the Bible, and this is a very significant story in the Bible about the covenant, that he would have remembered Abraham and Sarah having a child in their old age. Then the angel goes on, and he starts to talk about this baby. And he says, you know, it's, it's, this baby's a part of a bigger picture. I mean, you're going to rejoice over this, but there's many others who are going to also rejoice. And this baby God is going to use in a, in a great way. And then he gives another proof. He says that this one is not going to drink wine or beer. And what he's talking about there is a second thing that Zechariah would have known about, and it's the Nazarite vow. And that Nazarite vow was given... To people who totally devoted their, their lives to, Christ, to God. And to be used for Him exclusively. 
And that was one of the parts of the Nazarite vow was that they would t never touch any type of alcoholic drink whatsoever kind of thing. And so that was just, that was part of it. So he would have known about Samson. He would have known about Samuel and, and some of the other ones who have taken this Nazarite vow. And he's saying this child that is born is going to be of that caliber who's going to have this Nazarite type of vow upon them. But just again, the, he's speaking a language that Zechariah would understand. That's there. Um, he also says something that this baby is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. I don't know exactly all how that happens, but that God did that. If anything, this is another verse for the sanctity of life. That even in the womb, the value of the life, that the Holy Spirit can be infused into that child. And that meant that this child was ready to go. Right from day one, John. Um, and then, he gives another proof. The angel quotes from Malachi uh, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, these are the last verses of the Old Testament. Now, Zechariah would have known these because they would have, I mean, they would have quoted these. Um, they would have said these verses over and over again. These, maybe he would remember these more than anything because it's the last, this, the last part of it. It's the very ending of it. So the angel is going to explain about how this baby is a fulfillment of these last verses of the Old Testament. Of, that's all they had at that time. He's going to fulfill those. So those verses say, uh, Look, I'm going to send you in a prophet, uh, you the prophet Elijah, before the great and terrible uh, day of the Lord comes. And we find out from Jesus that, uh, that John the Baptist is that Elijah. And it says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So I want you to see this, that, that the angel is speaking on behalf of God, and God is, after 400 years, is just picking up the conversation. He, he stopped here. 400 years, he picks it right back up and he, sees, he starts with the, some of the same exact words that he ended with. And so here is another proof for Zechariah that, wow, okay, the very words of God are being spoken to me at the end. As we keep going now in this passage, um, he goes on to tell about this baby. He says this baby is going to help people return to God. He says this baby is going to help people return to holiness, to holy living. He says this baby is going to help people get converted to repent. This baby is also going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. This is the one who's going to come beforehand, clear the road, announce that he's coming, and also point him out. This is the Lamb of God. That's what this baby is going to do. Now, we're done talking about the baby. Zechariah has an opportunity to respond. Remember, he's a priest. He's righteous. He's got a great marriage. He's been serving in the uh, temple as a priest, noble possession, p position. Remember that he, he, he knows the story of Abraham and Sarah and them having a child in the old age. Remember that he knows about the Nazarite vow and what all that entails and how God uses people in that way. Also remember that he knows the last verses of Malachi and that the, when the angel was speaking those words, he knew exactly where those words were coming from. Okay, remember all that. But then he says, how can I know this? For I'm an old man and I'm married to an old woman. That's, that's, that's my version there. He said, yeah, he says, how can this happen? Well, can I ask you this morning, have you ever doubted God? Have you ever doubted what he says? Have you ever limited God and what he can do? Have you ever boxed God in? See, the Bible is relevant. You don't have to make it relevant. It is relevant. Here's a very righteous man when God speaks, and he's got a plenty of background here to work with. He goes, um, 
Well, I'm not sure. So then Gabriel gives another proof. One more. This is the fourth one. <laughs> he says his name. He says, I'm Gabriel. And when he says his name is Gabriel, Mal, uh, ne Nehemiah, Zechariah, there we go, I get it, would have went directly, his thoughts would have went directly to the book of Daniel. Because that's where, Jer where Gabriel is mentioned in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Revelation is the book of prophecy, of talking about end times. If you don't have the New Testament and you just have the Old Testament, the book of Revelation in the Old Testament is the book of Daniel. And so his mind would have went right to this passage, couple passages of Scripture that I want to read to you about when Gabriel showed up the first time. And so if you have your Bibles, you can, you can turn there. Daniel chapter 8 is the first one. And I, as I read these uh, few verses here, starting in verse 15, I want you to get the picture of how, how this is so similar to what is going on right now in Zechariah's life. So starting at chapter 8, verse 15, it says, While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there stood before me someone who appeared to be a man. And I heard a human voice calling from the middle of the Eula, uh, Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. And so he approached, and when I was stand, where I was standing, and when he came near, I was terrified and fell face down. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision refers to the time of the end. See, Gabriel had done this before. This was not his first run at this. He had already come before Daniel and was trying to explain what was going to happen in the times that were coming. And Daniel, when he saw Gabriel, the angel, was afraid. Even went right down to the ground in that situation. See, Zechariah would know this story. And now go to chapter 9. Chapter 9, starting at verse 20. And listen, this one is eerie. Uh, verse 20. While I was speaking praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my petition before the Lord my God concerning the holy mountain of my God. What is Daniel doing? Daniel's doing the exact same thing that Zechariah was doing at that moment. He's standing in front, putting the incense down, praying for the people that are there. Verse 21, while I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in my first vision, reached me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening, off, of the evening offering. When is Zechariah? It's most likely the evening offering that he is doing at that time. Verse 22, he gave me this explanation. Daniel, I've come now to give you an understanding. And at the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out. And I have come to give it, for you are treasured by God. So consider the message un and understand the vision. <laughs> Gabriel says to Daniel, uh, you're here and you're giving a petition. I'm giving you the answer right now. What's Zechariah doing? He's standing there giving this petition for the coming Messiah. And what's Gabriel do? He says, I'm giving you the answer right now. See, Zechariah would have known that. And, and it would have clicked when he said his name, Gabriel. And said, well, this has happened before. This has happened before. So now God calls Zechariah out. And he nails him. He says, you don't believe me. You don't believe my words. You're, you're righteous. You have a righteous life. You're righteous living. But when it comes down to me saying it and actually saying this is going to happen, you doubt me. You doubt me. And it made me think. You know, do I truly believe? Do I truly believe what he says? Do I truly believe in a heaven and a hell? Do I truly believe there's going to be a judgment today, uh, someday, and, and that, that there are people are going to go one place or the other? Do I truly believe that? Do I truly believe that he rose from the grave? Do I truly believe that? And if I truly believe that, would there be anything in my life that I would be doing differently? Would there be anything in my life that I would be saying differently? Would there be anything? Uh, 
yeah, there probably would be. Just let it sink in. Yeah, yeah, I, I know already of areas that I need to surrender over to God. So I need to truly believe in Him. So the people are waiting for Him to come out and, um, and, and, and pronounce a benediction because that's what they would do. They would pronounce a benediction after they came out. And, and He didn't come out. I'm sure that there were some, uh, you know, uh, maybe some Israelite ladies that were thinking, you know, we've got a pot roast in the crock pot and if He doesn't come out soon, it's going to burn. And so where is He? Where is He? And so... Um, in Numbers 6, 22 through the end of the verse, or chapter, it says, this is what they would proclaim when they came out. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, that's the priestly line, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. You should say to them, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. In this way, they will pronounce my name over the Israelites and I will bless them. So that's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for him to come out to do that. But when he came out, the preacher had no voice. And uh, they, the greatest thing that ever happened in his whole life, probably once in a lifetime, and he couldn't say anything about it. Now, the angel did say that he would speak again. When everything was fulfilled, he would be able to speak again. So he's got nine months, nine months where he can't say anything, but he can what? Think. <laughs> Like, what am I going to say when I get to open my mouth? And also think, why? Oh, man. Mm, why didn't I see this? Why did I doubt what he said all that time? So the people realized that there, there had to be some type of explanation. Um, he, tries, he goes into sign language. He does actually charades. This is, the first, this is where the game came from. The, he did charades. You know, and I was... Is, kind of comical thinking about how did he describe this to those people out there you know you know or what, whatever he did and then and then that 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 even dwarfs it though because it says the week is over he goes back home to elizabeth and you think elizabeth greets him at the door how did it go honey and yeah and uh, you know well, well anything exciting happen uh two words you know or, you know probably i mean it must have been i mean got to the point of you know, and she must have looked down like, whoa, wow, I think that wine was a little too fermented that they had there or something. But, but just imagine the amount, the, the time he must have went through that exchange. But then for her to conceive. And, and you'll notice that she didn't post it immediately on Facebook. You notice that? 60 plus years old. She's a smart woman. She's like, um, I'm going to wait a little while. I'm going to wait five months. I'm going to let there be a little evidence going on here that something is happening. But then it's, it's all about what she says at the end here. She said, the Lord has done this for me. She points right to the Lord. She says, the Lord has done this for me. He has personally touched my life. Luke wants us to see that because that's what Jesus wants to do. He personally wants to touch your life. And then she says, he, he looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. And Jesus has come to take away our disgrace. He's come to take away our sin. And so this is how the story continues after 400 years of silence. You have Zechariah whose name means God remembers, is married to Elizabeth, whose name is my God is faithful, and they're going to have a son named John, whose name is God is gracious. So the God who remembers is faithful, and he's bringing grace. He's bringing grace. And so we start the gospel according to Luke. Let's bow in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your word. And we thank you so much. I, I praise you this morning because I know as we go through this gospel that you are going to touch people's lives. And they're going to realize that um, you're real. And, 
And maybe this morning too, those of us who are living a righteous life in, and we know the laws and we know um, the commandments and, and we, we strive to follow after them. Lord, that it would be a challenge this morning that when you speak, when you lay something out and we can go back to the Scripture and we can see where you did this before and, and we can see even the words of God that are presented in it, that we would step forward and uh, not doubt you. But like that song was, that to say all your promises, Lord, are yes and amen. They are in our lives. So Lord, us seasoned Christians, if we are challenged this morning that if there are any area of our life that we need to surrender over to you, that we would do something truly different if, if it tru we truly believed, Lord, that we would surrender over so that we would, so that we would, it, it would be well with our soul, Lord, this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this account so given to us. And I, I, I pray that it challenges our souls. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing through this song again for our closing? quaked before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard through it all through it all 